And now on one, the main edition of Open Air with Jane Irving and Gloria Honeyford. And a very warm welcome along to Open Air. We're very pleased you've been able to join us today. And our special guest on the program is the actress Julie Walters. Julie the star has become Julie the mum. And she'll be talking to us later on and indeed taking your calls about her dual role. She's even on the phones at the moment. I know, she? we've got her to work already. And also barrister Helena Kennedy will be talking about motherhood of a different kind. Mothers behind bars after last night's Channel 4 documentary. And also we're going to be asking the question, how would you survive without a car? Not very well, I suspect. Well, the answers and the problems were in last night's World in Action programme. So this is the lineup on today's open air. At 10 past 11, running on empty, how to survive without a car. At 20 past 11, mothers behind bars, should children be with mothers who are serving time? At 25 to 12, it's Query Corner. We answer your questions about television. And at 20 to 12, educating Julie, your calls to actress and mum, and also Julie Walters. So that's how it is between now and midday here on Open Air. And this is the number if you'd like to give us a call. And our lines are never closed. And uh, this is a selection of what you've been phoning us about so far this morning on the Open Line. <laughs> I've just unfortunately switched on to Jim Davidson and I didn't realise he was auditioning for a job at Conservative Central Office. He has obviously run out of jokes concerned with his drink driving convictions and he boasts about his working class background in South London. I'm sure he is as popular there as the poll taxes. I'd just like to complain about it. It's racist, it's sexist, it's abusive language, foul language. I don't find it funny in the slightest. I've just watched Channel Sports, Cutting Edge, Mothers Behind Bars. I found it very moving, but do feel that these women knew the law and the rules when they broke them. They should have thought to this before committing the acts that they did. It's such a shame, I think, that this sort of thing happens in the world, but it was a very good programme. Well, we love to get all your comments, so keep those calls naturally coming in on the programme. Now, how many times have you just popped out to the shops only to find that it's impossible to resist jumping into the car parked very conveniently in your drive? Guilty from the beginning. Well, if you and your car are inseparable, you'd have been brought down to earth with a bang by last night's World in Action programme. Part one last week showed how a group of people, all related, by the way, and with various lifestyles, coped without their cars. Last night, the story continued, and for the most of the participants in the experiment, the week was one of the longest and the most traumatic in their whole lives. Dave is now back in Blackpool. Without his car, he's only managed to visit three customers, but he's been on five buses, two trains, and spent over £10 in fares. I didn't expect to pay so much, especially that the transport on the buses uh, over here in Blackpool, I found it very expensive. Uh, it appears to me that you pay 75 pence just to, be, just to walk through the doors of the bus before you even get on your journey. Yeah, I bought a new pair of shoes on Saturday. Good walking shoes, but obviously they need some breaking in. So, my little toy is a little bit sore at the moment. <laughs> How's it going so far? Oh, terrible. An hour and 15 minutes from Fleetwood to get here. Uh, I think I spent about four and a half hours travelling on the, on the public transport, so I'm absolutely knackered. I'm getting nowhere fast. <laughs> well, he's recovered enough, fortunately enough, to be with us this morning, Dave Abbott, and of course, Viv Simpson, who's the producer. Dave, just wanted to ask you, first of all, I mean, we watched you, of course, during that programme, pretty exhausted. The image, I didn't think, was quite right, mind you, with the old rucksack on the back. That's right, yeah. It's it not my image at all, really, but uh, that was the necessary items that I had to carry, you see, because uh, just the basic essentials in the rucksack. I mean, where else would I put them without the car, you see? That was the problem. So what were the main disadvantages, should I say? What was it? Cost? Was it inconvenience? Well, what was first it? of all, the cost, the actual uh, loss of time in, in travelling, because uh, travelling to Blackpool and Fleetwood, maybe two hours, whereas I could make it in 40 minutes normally by car. 
So and, and, and your rate of achievement obviously took a bit of a dive oh as yeah, well, I didn't mean, it? Uh, my performance, if you, if you rate it on a percentage basis, then I was down 50% you know, on, on the college. Just going to take the calls in, in, in one second, yeah. but I just want to establish, first of all, the, the real reason behind it. Was, the envir was it the environment? Was it too many cars on the road? What was it? Yes, it's a platform to look at the problem of motor cars and the number of private cars on the road. There are many issues which it touches. Clearly, environment is one of the biggest ones pushing uh, uh, people to say that the number of cars should be restricted at the moment, but it was also a look at public transport. Uh, but basically it was, we hoped, a, a very subjective but, but very head-on view of car dependency and what you do about it. Right, well lots of calls coming in about that. So Stephen Ridge is the first one off today from Salisbury. Good morning Stephen. Good morning Gloria. And your question? Um, first of all I'd like to congratulate the producer on the programme. I think it opened a lot of people's eyes. But my main point of question is, why not pick on somebody in a higher power position, like a company director or a junior minister, who has a chauffeur-driven car at their disposal 24 hours a day. Put them on a commuter train for a week and see how they would react to the complaints they get about public transport. It's a good idea, um, and um, may maybe that, that should be done. Uh, I think uh, when we were ma making the program, or thinking about making the program, uh, we thought about various ways of doing it. What I wanted to do was actually get the problem down to everyday car users, uh, and that's you, me, everybody else who drives a car. Uh, if you go along the line of, for example, as you suggested, junior minister, very interesting, I'm sure, um, but that tips it away slightly because you, most of us come to that and say, oh, that's them, it's a problem for them, mm -hmm. and it's that that I wanted to get away from. It's actually a problem for all of us, and that's why it's centred around normal car users. Yes, and, and also, of course, there's a whole host of people in London, say, who never use cars, but I, I thought, well, when they get home to their own environment, wherever that may be, they are still car users out there. Well, so yours was a good, a good example, I mean, cars, uh, cars are uh, in public transport, and cars are not just used for commuting runs. Uh, there are a whole host of uses to which we put cars, uh, and that was the, the range which I wanted to address. Well, without the car, we're off to Blackburn this time, and Barbara Clarkson, good morning to you, Barbara. Uh, good morning, Gloria. So what was your observation about the programme? Well, I, I enjoyed it, but I also thought it was very unrealistic, really. Because, in what way? Uh, I thought it was contrived for the benefit of the cameras. Um, people plan their lives around cars and they wouldn't have been doing what we were seen, seeing them struggle to do if they hadn't had a car, if they didn't have a car at all. Uh, for example, the salesman wouldn't have a job in Blackpool if he lived in Accrington with no car. Uh, the company would have, would have picked somebody in Blackpool. The, the lady wouldn't go all those miles to shop at the supermarket for a week shopping on public transport. So you thought that in a way it was unrealistic because the organisation wasn't there, that sort of, of course, backup yeah. organisation. Yeah. Is that a fair point, well, you I, think, I Dave? can answer that one as regards myself, Barbara, because uh, uh, basically I found that the, the journey, the easiest part of the journey was actually travelling from home to Blackpool. It was the actual short journeys where, where the problems arose for me, the actual getting from A to B in Blackpool. All the, all the short journeys caused me a problem. The long journeys no problem at all. Because a few people didn't know the timetables of public transport, right, which didn't yeah. help either, did they? I mean, presumably if you're That's using right. public transport all the time, you That's would be right. better organised. I mean, that, yeah. but then that is clearly one of the problems, that you have to get to know timetables, where do you go for that information, how difficult is it to get that. Come back to Barbara's question about contrived. Yes, clearly it is contrived, because it's an experiment for a week, and Dave and everybody else knew, apart from anything else at the end of it, that they were going to go uh, and get their cars back, should, if that's what they decided. They weren't doing it forever. But having said that, I don't think it was, uh, um, for example, Barbara mentioned the lady shopping, Elaine, Dave's sister, went shopping. Um, it wasn't all that many miles, it was two miles, really, by road, uh, a two minute journey on the train. Um, lots of women go shopping quite regularly to supermarkets with buggies, with children, and any mother who does that and then comes back on the bus will know full well the agony of what Elaine suffered. That, that's right, and then we've had a lot of calls this morning saying you've got to remember there was life before the car. I mean, not everybody's got a car, which you've got to remember, but Jackie Hook, this time from Oxford. Good morning, Jackie. Hello. And what's your opinion? Well, um, my opinion, Gloria, is why didn't they do a comparison of a person like myself who, no way can I afford a car, you know, and they didn't do that. I mean, the program was very good, and I have to go shopping every week, and I have to lug that shopping home, you know, and I've got myself a bicycle, and I go, I, I cycle 20 miles a week from, to and from work, you know, 
And I enjoy it. You must be a very fit lady. I think. am. <laughs> and I'm pleased, you know. And it, it's, um, you know, you need a lot of courage on the roads, obviously, with a bike, but I do it. Because so I what, have to. Your, what's your opinion about that, David? Well, I must admit, there are certain parts of my, of my family who didn't need a car. I mean, uh, that was the first thing I'll admit to. But uh, obviously, I did need a car. I mean, that week when I had, when I didn't have the car, I walked 70 miles, never mind cycled 20 miles. <laughs> I mean, I did walk 70 miles. So, yeah, I mean, parts of my family don't need a car. But, uh, well, what is interesting, and what, what did emerge, is the fact that it's the women who really do seem to need cars nearly more than mm -hmm. anybody else, with, all, with the children, all those runs to, to and from school, all the you know, ballet lessons, dancing lessons, seeing their friends, whatever that uh, is involved there, plus all that heavy shopping. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the very interesting things is mm -hmm. who most of us think essential car users are. And uh, we all tend to think, if we drive, that we're essential car users and the other person isn't. And again, that's, that I think is something that the programs threw up. Uh, that uh, women and children are often dismissed to the, uh, the bottom of the pile as far as, uh, as alternatives are concerned uh, could easily be, in many circumstances, the essential car user with public transport on offer as it is at the moment. Sure. Let's take another call. This time it's Graeme Smith. Good morning, Graeme. Good morning. And your point? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, the thing is, it was an interesting programme, but I think the producer slipped up on quite a few things. For example? Uh, uh, why couldn't um, Mr. Haber stay in Blackpool for the night? Uh, the cost of bed and breakfast uh, would have been cheaper, and also uh, he'd have made more calls and saved the company money. Um, well, Dave, did you want to stay oh, in Blackpool for the night? Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I'd like to stay in Blackpool, but I don't just work in Blackpool, Graham. I also work in Lancaster, Morecambe, and Cornforth. So I don't, that's just not my area. I mean, I've got to, and the, the experiment was, can I do the same job without my car? That means, i.e., going from home and back home again at the end of the night, you mm -hmm. know, so. Now, now, if the end result of this experiment, and it was very interesting just to see how everybody managed, was to actually help the environment by, you know, fewer cars on the road, less fuel being used, do you honestly believe that you could ever persuade people to willingly give up their cars? I think it's going to be very difficult because I think um, most of us need pushing. Most of us are like the comfort and the freedom that our car brings, and I'm as bad an example of that as everybody else. But you know at the back of your mind that it can't go on the way it's going on, and you know that therefore you're going to have to put some personal effort into it. And once you do that, things then become easier. But I do think it's going to be extremely difficult for people to take so that So it step. would be legislation that would insist really? Well, that is already happening in other countries. It's already happening here, in a sense, with the price differential between leaded and unleaded petrol. I can see more initiatives like that, certainly. And, and what would be your final observation about public transport? Because that also came under great scrutiny, didn't it? It did. Uh, the trains were quite good on the timetables, uh, but you can tell that uh, it's running down slowly uh, because of possibly lack of investment, I would say. Uh, the bus services, since they became privatised, I would say, they mainly cater for volume traffic where they're going to make a profit. Uh, Possibly once it gets six o'clock at the night, they tend to disappear off the roads. So that's my. Well, it was a fascinating time. experiment, and clearly our viewers enjoyed it. So thank you both very much indeed, Dave and Viv, for joining us. And now it's back to Jane. Thanks very much, Gloria. And Julie Walters is going to be joining us a little later on. So if you want to talk to her about any of her television roles or film roles, or even her new role as a mother, then uh, pick up the phone and give us a call. But we're, we're turning now to mothers of a different kind because. When a mother is sent to prison, she's often not the only one to suffer. It can be a shattering experience for her children. The question is, should they also be punished when a woman commits a crime? Well, last night, the Channel 4 series Cutting Edge looked at a scheme operating in New York State in which children are allowed to spend a week with their mothers. Mothers, that is, who are behind bars. Sometimes I forget I have a mother. Do you? Sometimes. And then sometimes I miss her. No matter how good you are here, they never forgive you for what you do. You have a, we have a long, if you have a long sentence here, you do a long sentence. What will happen when you have to go home? I'll say bye to my mother and I'll come back next time. Will you be sad about that? Yes. But you'll be back for Christmas. Be happy when I come back and see you. Well, joining us in our London studio is the barrister Helena Kennedy, who was also the reporter on the documentary. Good morning to you, Helena. It's an extremely powerful and very emotional documentary. Um, 
But I suppose watching it, one thing that, that did occur to me was that the separation involved between a mother and a child, why is it any worse for mothers than it is for the hundreds and thousands of men who are separated from their children when they go into prison? Well, there's no doubt that, that men suffer the same sense of loss. I, I wouldn't attempt to suggest that, that men don't feel the same things. Um, but I think that uh, in, in our society, certainly, we still have a situation where, where women are usually the primary carers. And, uh, and our society builds around the special relationship between mother and child. And so I think that for women going to prison, there's often a special sense of failure, that it goes to the very core of your, yourself as a woman, that you've fallen down on, on perhaps the most precious job that you'll ever have of, of caring and looking after your children. And I think that um, the reason that I concentrated on women in making this film was that I wanted us to think about um, about this is the first step because I think that um, if we could introduce some of these ideas here in Britain then the next step would be to try and look at ways in which we could do it for men as well I mean basically there's an awful lot of women in prison in Britain who shouldn't be in prison at all and uh, and uh, and also here sentences are very much shorter um, and I think that if we started here then we would move on to the situation for men now it, was, it, it was incredible watching it because uh, you saw some of the shots that it didn't look like you were in a prison at all with with mothers down on their knees and playing with children in this sort of environment mm -hmm. but I suppose inevitably there are some people who are going to say well these women have committed crimes why should their life be made pleasant inside prison by being able to have their children with them this is really an issue about about uh, children's rights and I think that it's a, it's, a, it's a misconception to start it, start looking at it necessarily from the point of view of the, of the woman. If you start from that point of not being sympathetic for the pain and the double pain that people feel about, uh, about separation from their children after they've committed a crime, then, then, then clearly, that, you know, I'm not going to win your sympathy for, for women prisoners, but I would ask you to look at, uh, look at it from the point of view of children. And it's a children's rights issue. The children want to see their mothers. Children love their mothers, whatever their mothers have done. And, uh, and that's the thing we have to think about, is the damage that we inflict on children. And so I would say to, to members of society and to judges who sentence, it's, it's a children's rights issue. And I'd like to look at it for, for this time from their point of okay. view. Okay, Helena for the moment, thank you very much. And with uh, Helena is Jill French and two of her children, 15-year-old Emma and Sarah, who's four. And Jill spent four years in Holloway Prison. Good, good morning to you all. Jill, perhaps you could tell us what you were actually in prison for. Uh, supplying drugs. And how old were your children at the time? Uh, my eldest was ten, Emma, and I had another daughter, Joanne, who was five, and plus I was three months pregnant when I was, went into Holloway. So what kind of effect did it have on your children when you, when you went into prison? Um, they just didn't realise what was happening. They didn't realise how long I was going to be in there. They were expecting me out any time. Um, I really don't think they understood what was going on at all. And what was the visiting like when they came to see you in prison? Heartbreaking. I had a quarter of an hour with them and, and it was just in a packed visiting room over, over a table. I wasn't allowed to hold them. The prison officers were all around us watching and we just cried for a quarter of an hour. Just, we couldn't talk, we couldn't do anything. We just cried constantly. Emma, perhaps I could turn to you now. Um, I mean, what kind of memories do you have of those visits? Um, well, they weren't, you know, there's lots of things I wanted to tell my mum and that of what I've been doing. But, you know, we couldn't because we only had a short visit and all like, we wanted to do was just cuddle her and, you know, tell her how much we loved her and that. It wasn't. And do you think that you've suffered some kind of ill effects after that? I mean, your mum was inside for, for six months. I mean, what, uh, do, you th do you notice in yourself that you may have suffered as a result of, of those visits? Well, no, I don't, I don't think I've suffered, but, you know, it's, well, how <laughs> to put it, really. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's sort of difficult to tell, maybe, yeah. at this stage. Okay, well, let's turn to our first caller this morning, Mary Miller from Perth. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I do object very strongly to children serving sentence for the parents' crime. And the majority of offenders' children do not like visiting prison. And the majority of decent prisoners do not like their children seeing them in prison. And from babes in arms to five-year-olds, they don't even know where they are because they're running about in the most beautiful canteen. And, you know, when you think about it, but from five years onwards, the children begin to resent being made to visit prison because, after all, they too have their freedom and their rights. And Saturday and Sunday is their day off 
why should they be made to visit prison? And, you know, the majority of prisoners, when they do bring the children in, the children are dumped on a sort of runabout wild. And they ask you to bring in more volunteers to look after their children. So why the heck bring them up in the first place? And, you know, the lady there sitting talking about she did two years for selling, uh, uh, was it drugs? Does she ever think of the children who've been born with AIDS and the victims of these drugs? Their children can only visit them in the cemetery. Well, uh, let's, keep, let's keep off that point for, for the moment. Now, you, uh, what do you think of the scheme that we saw in the documentary last night? Where well, I think it's most unfair to children because I see children daily in prison, daily. And I think it's and some of the nicest children in the world I've seen in prison visiting their parents. And it's rather, rather sad that these children are serving the same sentence as their father. And don't forget, those children are human beings too. And for the, the, uh, the Kennedy, the Lady Kennedy talking about children's rights, has she any children? Would well, she? Let's, let's just ask Helena what her view is about what you're saying there. I'm the mother of three children, and I, and I identify very closely with women separating from their children. But I'm looking at this very much as a lawyer who's concerned about children's rights. And I'm surprised at someone like Mary Miller, who says that she has a very long experience with prisons, not to realize that one of the problems for children in coming into prisons, and one of the reasons why they find it such a uh, spiritless experience and, how, and so hard for them, is because we don't do anything very much in this country or in Scotland um, to make those, those visits much more satisfactory. Of course, children are going to find it a very unhappy and painful time if we don't let them have the cuddles, the, the, the sitting on laps, the, 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 the real intimacy that clearly one saw in the film, it is possible to create. And I'm happy to say that not everybody feels like Mary Miller. There are many people involved in prisons up and down this country, prison visitors, people involved in the parole board, and I'm happy to say people at the Home Office who, unlike Mary Miller, do identify a problem and who do want to, to try and make the situation better and who don't believe that prison is about adding to the punishment of mothers by punishing their children too. Okay, let's turn to our next caller now, Jean Jones from Birmingham. Good morning to you, Jean. Good morning, Jane. What do you think? Well, I think she's talking an absolute load of rot. Who is talking uh, a load of rot? Mary Miller from Perth. She, she's obviously talking about a man's prison. When children go in to, to visit the fathers, at least they've got the stability of going home with mom, of having mum's cuddles. You're talking about children who are without the mothers. Okay, we do something wrong. I, incidentally, done six months for driving offences, and I feel very strongly that I should never have been there. I appealed, and my, and my appeal was sort of short, short, did shorten my sentence. Do you have children, Jean? Yes, I have a threat. My daughter at the time was three years old. Um, her father died when she was one. Um, I was on my own, so I had to rely on family, and thank God she didn't have to go into care. But unless you are a mother in that position you are being punished you you've lost your freedom you've lost the rights whatever you have in, in society when you're you're on the outside but why do children have to be punished once a fortnight every two weeks my daughter used to go out of there screaming and i actually put a stop to to her visits because of the trauma not only to my daughter but to myself as well it hurts so very much and you, you, when you, you last see your child, they go out and you've got this mental picture. And even in the short space of two weeks, the next time you see your child, the change is in those two weeks. So people who, who sort of have, are in different sort of prisons to what I was in, when they've got to go and they only get one visit a month. Okay. It's well, Jean, thanks very much for ringing us and uh, telling us your experience. And I wonder what uh, Jill French thought listening to what you had to say there. Jill, yes. did that strike a lot of bells with you? Yes, definitely. I only saw my children were being looked after by my father in, in Yorkshire, which is a long way for him to travel to, to London to visit me. And I saw them twice in one year, and um, I just felt as though I didn't know them. I didn't want to, to listen to what they were doing outside because I was spending such a short time with them. And from the times I saw them, from like one time I, they visited me to the next time, so much had happened. It was just heartbreaking, and I just didn't feel as though I was the mother. I just thought I, that I was a complete failure to them. And how difficult was it for you to kind of overcome those feelings when you eventually came out of prison? Was, it, was there quite a lot of scarring to be healed there? Well, yes, because Sarah was also ha uh, having to start to know her sisters because she didn't sort of know them. She wouldn't go to them because she'd been with me 24 hours a day. and. So she was so, per 
she was with me all the time. She was protective. She wouldn't go towards Emma. She wouldn't go towards her other sister or my father or anybody, and which made that difficult as well because um, I felt as though they might reject her as well as a sister. Okay, let's go to Liz Hunt now. Good morning to you, Liz. Oh, good morning. Um, I found the pro program very moving last night. I have a four and a half month old son myself, and to feel that I could be separated from him for any length of time would be most traumatic. Um, I just wondered if Helena had any um, hope that the same sort of scheme could be introduced into Britain in the near future. Helena? Well, Jane, that, that's exactly what I'm hoping will come from this film. Um, when Pauline Bight and I made this film, it, that was really what we were hoping we might persuade people to do. And we were hoping that up and down the country there would be people who would say, really, we have to be taking this sort of thing on board here. And that might, they might write to the Home Office. And I know that the Home Office just now is really trying to think of ways in which they can ameliorate um, th those visiting times and try and improve the situation. And so they're open to new ideas. And I'm very happy to say that we showed the film to members of the Home Office on, on Friday. And there was a very response, uh, considerable response, and, and people were sympathetic and interested in perhaps the idea of a pilot scheme. But what we need is lots of people in the public to say, please, let, let's think about ways of doing this. Because it's a new generation. We're creating the, uh, a new generation who are going to be damaged unless we start taking this on board. And I think we've never really thought through the problem. And so, um, I, yes, I'm hopeful, and that was the purpose of the program from my point of view as a lawyer who works in the criminal justice system and who sees um, the effects of it. So, On a pragmatic level, Helena, is there any evidence to prove that the conventional way of treating women in prison who have children, which is not to give that kind of intimate access to their children, does it actually provoke any kind of problems within the prison system? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, there are... There are prison officers always tell you that in fact it's, it's incredibly difficult with the situation we have now because children if you try and contain children we know it ourselves those of us who have children if you try and actually have a conversation with children across a table and we and you ask them formal questions about you know how was your day at school and how, how is how are you liking staying with granny they're likely to answer you in monosyllables it's not any good uh, it's not a, the best way of, of communicating children get restless and unhappy about being contained in that way and it makes the, the job harder for prison officers if you actually soften it up and, and allow space and allow the media to play and things to play with, it makes the prison officer's job much, much easier. It's also much more fulfilling for prison officers to feel that there actually is something positive that they're doing. Okay. Helena, thank you very much indeed for coming on and debating your documentary and also very much to uh, Jill French and to Emma and to little Sarah there. Okay. And thank you very much indeed for calling. Right now it's time to go over to Gloria. Yes, I've just been sifting through some of your calls and uh, some general comment, really. Paul Nicholas from London, he's talking about soap operas. He says there's been no mention whatsoever of poll tax in any of the soaps. And he thinks that's very strange because, let's face it, a lot of the soaps really do involve social comments. So that's something that Paul wants. I don't think it's the singer, by the way, Paul Nicholas. Arthur Wakefield, he's calling in about the news earlier on today. He said there was an interview with the head of the Royal College of Nursing and she said they were crying out for nurses, especially in the South. Well, Arthur says, my son is aged 25, he's got nine O-levels, and he was turned down for nursing training because he hadn't enough qualifications. So that is very frustrating indeed to deal with. Kate O'Kane, and really she's only one of dozens of people who've called in about the Oscars. And in this case, Kate lives in County Antrim, so it's, of course, slightly biased. But she said, Dan Daniel Day-Lewis won the Best Actor. Brenda Fricker won, won the Best Supporting Actress. And they said two British actors won the Oscars. She said, surely they are Irish. You're absolutely right, Kate. And a lot of you think that credit should go where credit's due. John, who's in Dublin, he rings up about the Oscars that he saw on the news. He said they keep referring to British wins. He said this film is backed by Irish money. It was made in Ireland, and he feels that credit should go there. But congratulations to both the actors involved anyway. Very good news indeed. Now, coming up in open air, more of your calls on our open line. At 20 to 12, it's Query Corner. Your questions, of course, about television, including whatever happened to Lena Martell. And at a quarter to 12, your calls to the actress and now celebrity mum, Julie Walters. But first, more of your comments about television programs in our open line. <laughs> I'm phoning up to complain about how the in, uh, lady Indian guest on Wogan's show, hosted tonight by David Frost, is being made to look like a performing monkey. They're giving her um, different math problems to do. They've got a blackboard for her to perform on. She's an intellectual. She's, she's a genius. She shouldn't be made to appear in this light. I think it's very wrong. 
I just like to say thanks very much to the BBC for repeating the rock and roll years. Uh, it's, I'm a great rock and roll fan, and it's uh, a chance. I'm 25, and it's just a chance to see that, um, my heroes uh, actually performing live. Jim Davis has finished. Brilliant program, I thought. Very good. I don't know why you get a load of callers phoning up saying it's, it's not a very good program or he's sexist or racist. I've sat and watched his program, which perhaps brings a smile across my face, but I cannot understand why the audience sit back and, and appear to rock themselves, not only rock themselves with laughter, but roar with laughter. And I cannot understand why. Well, we had a lot of calls about Jim Davis, and I would say actually that they're fairly equally balanced. A lot of you are disgusted, but then an awful lot of you enjoy him as well. But if you're fascinated by Hancock, champion the wonder horse or want to know what has happened to lena martel then stay by your television because it's time for our regular tuesday slot query corner now tj bookley i'm sorry i don't have a christian name but wrote to us asking about the classic american series champion the wonder horse i remember it well i wonder in fact how many of you were thrilled as children by the following call which helped Herald adventure in the American Champion West. The Wonder Horse. Champion the Wonder Horse. Like a streak of light and flashing across the sky. Like a swift as arrow whizzing from a bow. Like a mighty cannonball, he seems to fly. You'll hear about him everywhere you go. The time will come when everyone will know the name of Champion. <laughs> Riding off into the sunset, all great stuff. Well, doubtless that series brings back fond memories for thousands of you. But T.J. Bookley was particularly curious about the number of episodes originally made back in 1956. And he can only remember 12 of them. Well, in fact, we've been checking. There's a total of 26 episodes, but only 25 remain in stock. Nobody seems to know where that missing one has gone to. And although the BBC has no immediate plans to repeat the series, the possibility isn't out of the question. Now, if I were to ask you to define classic comedy, you would probably sum it up like this. Tony Hancock. We regularly receive letters from viewers who want to know, is the series going to be repeated? And Mark Penny is just one of many fans who already has a lot of Hancock's material on video. He asks, are there any plans to release further episodes of Hancock's Half Hour on tape? Well, BBC Enterprises currently has six video cassettes on sale, which show a total of 18 episodes of That Great Man in Action. There are also four radio collection cassettes available. I think they're great, particularly if you're in the car. And although there are no plans to repeat any of the series, we have good news, because in the autumn, the BBC are releasing an additional radio collection cassette containing material previously unavailable to the general public. But in the meantime, this is a great excuse to have a quick reminder of some of the classic Tony Hancock at his best. Rightly so. <laughs> if you're interested in that clip, it can be found on the BBC video cassette. Here's a number BBC V, V for Victor, 4049. So that's cassette number BBC V 4049. And all the recorded material can be ordered through the usual retail outlets. Whatever happened to? Well, that's a question that we often get asked when it comes to television celebrities. I wonder, for example, how many of you remember this particular singer? She was number one in the charts in 1979. records still get played of course and Mary McCabe contacted us to ask 
what happened to Lena Martel? Because we never hear anything of her, see her on the telly these days. And for the rest of you who are wondering what happened to her, well, we've managed to track her down and she joins us on the telephone. So good morning to you, Lena. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning. Good morning, Gloria. It's been a while. The problem is actually, Lena, that uh, if, if you're not on the telly and if you're not top of the charts, people think that you're just not working. But in your case, that ain't true. No, I've been very busy, if not uh, doing concerts. I've been recording a lot and doing a lot of writing and uh, keeping very busy, spending time with my family. Now, when you say writing, is it mostly songs or different styles of writing? Uh, a lot of songs and I've uh, been writing some screenplays, one in particular and uh, I'm quite excited about it. And you're going to get involved in the production of that screenplay? Well, uh, I don't know about that, but uh, it certainly is very satisfying. Do you and miss I have enjoyed it. Sorry, I was just going to say, do you actually miss the very high profile setup that you used to have? Well, I, uh, I always had a very low profile throughout my entire career because I'm basically quite a shy person, but um, no, I don't miss it. Uh, I, I'm still in heavily involved in the music, and um, as I said, I'm still doing production. So, uh, and I'm still traveling. I uh, came back from Los Angeles just before Christmas to start work on this particular album that's due out in the shops in a few months. Well, uh, I look a forward to playing. A new single, uh, I think I want to release that in a few weeks. It's a very nice thing. I'm very excited about it. Good, and I look forward to playing it all on radio too. So thank you very much. Very nice to catch up with you indeed. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, actually, in this case, uh, as far as Creative Porn is concerned, that's all we've got time for. But I hope that you're going to keep sending in your questions about all those television topics. The address, I'm quite sure you know it by now, but it's Query Corner, Open Air, BBC Television, PO Box 27, Manchester, M61SJ. And although we clearly don't have time to answer all of your queries on there, we really genuinely enjoy reading them. So don't despair if you don't hear anything immediately. It might just mean that your query is going to be in open air next week. So over to Jane. Thanks very much, Gloria. Now, our special guest today is the actress, comedian, turned also Julie Walters, uh, who's just written a book called Baby Talk, which obviously is about uh, her experience of having her first child. Good morning to you. Good, Good morning. You. So did you have sort of very strong maternal yearnings then, Julie? No, well... No, not before I got pregnant. I mean, I wasn't somebody who was sort of driven, and some people are really desperate for children. I never felt that. I, it was always something I thought, oh, yes, I quite like it. I had broody feelings more. And, um, but it's wonderful. I mean, I mean, I feel maternal now. I mean, I was surprised at the feelings I felt after I'd given birth. I mean, they just welled up. <laughs> I mean, it's just extraordinary. I mean, partly hormonal, apparently, but you have this huge desire to protect everything, not just the baby. I mean, I used to be anything that was around, you know, the little bird, the cat was a bird enough for the first couple of days I was home with the baby. And I saw this little bird, this little bald head, and I was going, oh, you know, it was like, it was her, and I was deeply upset, you know, as if it was maybe it was on the kitchen floor, you know. It was extraordinary. Anyway, tell us about the uh, father of the child. How did you meet him? Grant. Yeah. I met him in a wine bar, as it happened. Lovely. You picked him <laughs> up, Julie, did you? Well, sort of, I think he sort of picked me up off the floor, probably. No, 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 now, <laughs> it's a family show. Um, no, <laughs> I, I, I've had a drop taken, and he, he did walk my friend and I home, and then he came round to, to mend the washing machine, and yeah. that's when I jumped on his back, basically. Literally. Literally jumped on it. Any I just fancy any doing particular that. Particular reason or no? <laughs> it just looked very inviting, so I jumped on it <laughs> and um, and asked him if he would like to have my children in yes. the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, that obviously worked out very well for you. <laughs> and one thing I wonder actually about being about having babies is does it not sort of kill off your ambition to do career things? You know, do you not feel oh I've had enough of all that now? I'm just going to be broody and have lots more. Mm, well, it certainly takes the edge off it. it I'm not. I mean, I, I think I was a workaholic before I got pregnant. I never thought so at the time, but it, it was one thing after another. I was always working, doing two or three times, at the, two or three things at the same time, you know. But, I mean, I, she comes before anything. She and Grant together as a unit, and all of us, really, come before the work. So the work has to sort of fit in around us. And it's more of an economic thing, though, economically based. You know, I think, is this a short job with lots of money? Then I'll do it. You know? We've got a reminder of your day job here, actually, because uh, Julie is, of course, probably best known to television viewers for her long-standing liaison with Victoria Wood. Here's a magic moment. Did you watch the news last night? <laughs> the nine o'clock? Ooh, nasty blouse. <laughs> <laughs> we stayed up for news at ten. Three bangles and a polo neck, thank you. Oh, no! Her ears are in the wrong place for a polo neck! <laughs> you need to be Princess
us die, really. Well, they've the length of bone, haven't they, the royal set? Mm. But the Queen's not got long bones. Oh, well, she spent all that time stood about with natives waving their doodads at her. <laughs> Our next daughter had sex again last night. Not again. I mean, I like a joke, but that's twice this month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, how did you two actually meet? We met, we met doing a, a, a review at the Bush Theatre in um, Shepherd's Bush in London. And um, it was called, it was very appropriately named actually, it was called <laughs> In at the Death. And the audience <laughs> were every night actually. It wasn't very good, but that's how we met. And she wrote one of the um, sort of playlets in it. Yeah. And it went down a bomb, I have to say. And then she was asked to write a play. And, um, and she wrote Talent, which we did for, for Granada, the other side of Nova. That's where we went and did a play for television. So how did you become the phenomena that you became then? I mean, how did you get t together as a, a comedy writing act? Well, she wrote this play, Talent, which she, she came rushing in the next day and said, a bloke came last night, has asked me to write a play, so I'll write you a part in it, you know. And she did, and it was this play. And, but I, couldn't, I wasn't free to do it. No one had ever said they were going to write a part for me before. And then I had to go to Bristol and do some plays there. So they did it on stage here, but then I did it when, on television. And then we did a follow-up to it, the same two characters that were in it, Maureen and Julie, they were called. And then we did a, pl a film for, for Granada as well. And then they, the producer, Peter Eckersley, who sadly died a few years ago, had the idea of us doing a comedy duo, you know, Wooden Walters. So did you write the stuff as well? or was No, it Victoria, Victoria wrote, wrote it all. all. Yes, everything, which yeah. is quite phenomenal. It is, it's incredible. Yeah, because every other series that you see has got lists of writers that long. You know. It was just her that wrote, and the music she writes as well. And what about the characters, like the Avon Lady character, I loved. I mean, was that not... Oh, do you mean in the, that was in the play, yeah. Good Fun, that we did? Oh, yes. Brilliant! It was a brilliant gift of a part. It was this, it was a play called Good Fun that we did at Sheffield Crucible, and I had this part of this woman Betty, who tur turns up to a cystitis sufferer's rally, <laughs> and um, <laughs> she turns it. She's there to sell cosmetics, and she comes to have this ten-minute speech all about um, if you you know all about blackheads and things. If you do get a little black visitor, don't touch it. You know, it was all <laughs> this. Just use our push-up blemish concealer. Anyway, there's this great long speech. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Have stuff. you got any faves from all the sketches that you've done together? I think Mrs. Overall is my favourite. Yeah. And the old lady who's serving the soup. I think that's my. Those are some of my favourites. Oh, there's loads, actually, but I think loads are my favourites. And of course, the amazing thing is you've done the serious stuff as well. Of, or I suppose you called it semi serious working with Alan Bennett because uh, apart from you work with Victoria Wood, Julie's probably, of course, best known uh, on television for her partnership with the writer Alan Bennett. And uh, here in the award winning Talking Heads, she plays the role of an actress who's arresting, if you know what I mean. Oh, just superb. Fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, it must be difficult to, to, to learn, you know, a one piece yeah. like that when it's just you. It was murder. Because I was in, in the West End at the time doing a play as well, so trying to learn is, I nearly drove, it, it, that's how you split up relationships, getting the other half to listen to the lines. Because you're desperately trying to remember them, and then he'll come in at the wrong time, no, don't tell me, and there's all that going on. It's terrible. And I did eventually get it, but. So you tend to lock yourself away when you're learning a lot of stuff. Yes, that's the only way to do it, really. In the bath is the best. But we've got lots of people who want to talk to you. Juliet Joseph is on the line now from Bowden. Hello, Juliet. Hello. Hello, Hello Jane. Hello, Gloria. Hello, Julie. Hello. I'm really excited to be speaking to you. Oh, that's nice. Uh, I'm a great admirer of yours. Oh, woman um, of taste. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to ask you what your views on spoiling children are. Um, I have a child that I had a later on, and I must admit there's a tendency to dote on them, you know. And, I mean, we all want to give them the things that we didn't have. Yeah. Um, but, you know, before I married, I worked as a nanny in the States uh, for an older couple with one child. He was quite sweet, but extremely spoiled. Mm. He's got his own life-size electric train, designer clothes, etc. But What's he just couldn't <laughs> share anything, you know, mm. with other children. He'd get, and another child would get on the train and scream blue murder. Mm. And uh, um, I just wondered, you know, do you, do you agree that children should have some idea of the material side of life, you know, have some proper values? I mean, you got yours from the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> not sure what so, I got from the nuns, but yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, how, how do you avoid going over the top, you know, with your own child? How do you stop spoiling them? Well, Juliet, it is very hard because you do love them so fiercely. But on the other hand, hopefully I love her enough for her to know where the boundaries are. I mean, just for safety reasons. I mean, she, at the moment, she's only sort of 23 months. So it's hard, to, uh, discipline is quite hard because they have a little will but no sense of reason really. So that it is difficult but we do show her 
that, you know, like she can't stand up in the high chair and go, ah, ah, like that, because it's dangerous, you know. And uh, we have to, if she does that, she's taken out, and she knows that, that so, she, so she stopped doing that. And she, there are little rules that she abides by, and which uh, always shocked, I mean, it shocked us the first time, because we told her she couldn't go running about with food in her hand. Actually, our nanny told her this, because it's just food, you know, rusk or something like that. It's all over the floor and everywhere. Yeah. So, so now she knows if she has something to eat, she sits down, it doesn't matter where she is, she sits down. The other day she got something given her in a supermarket, she just plopped down <laughs> in the middle of the floor and everything. It was so sweet. But I do think, oh yes, I do believe in um, not giving them absolutely everything they come up when they ask for something in a shop, they don't just get it straight away or anything like that, because I didn't. And, um, and it doesn't give you any sort of real sense of what life's really like. You know. Do you know what I think is really good, though, to give to children? I th personally, I think that praise is a great yeah, thing to give vital. to children. You know, there's some parents who, who say, oh, you know, well, you've got to do better, and uh, mm -hmm. this is not good enough, and yeah. we want better results the next time. I personally think that praise is a wonderful thing to give mm -hmm. within love. Yes, absolutely, so do I. I think confidence and liking yourself is vital in life to get by. Yeah. If you're constantly told that you know, you're not good enough or that isn't good enough, you've got to try harder, then all you feel is inadequate eventually. Okay, yeah. let's talk to um, Jonathan Lee is on the line from Warwick. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Hello. Jonathan. <laughs> Hello, Julie. Well, I know. What's it like trying to learn your lines for a film and then trying to think about writing a book whilst being preg about pregnancy and being pregnant at the same time? Well, you, you think you're following in my footsteps then, <laughs> <laughs> How old are you? Ten. Oh, yes, that means you're ten. Where are you speaking from? Warwick. You're well, not just outside Warwick. You're not at school? No, I, no, I'm off with the flu. Oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, yes, I've got a bad chest myself. Oh, right, I was just checking, you know. <laughs> I've got what you asked me now. Oh, what was it like to... R yes, hard, actually. But um, when I was writing the book, I was really... Uh, and I was pregnant and I was doing Buster, the film. I was only sort of making notes. It was rather pleasant to sit down and write about my condition in the evening, <laughs> as it were, after the filming. That was quite a pleasant thing to do. It wasn't light work, because I was really enjoying being pregnant. So it was nice to jot down things that I'd felt. So that wasn't too bad, but and also working on the film, I didn't. That was up until I was about four and a half months. I mean, I couldn't uh, doing anything after that. I wouldn't have. Uh, it would have been. It's harder that you know to keep the pressures of work down then because you get tired. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We hope you get better soon. Yes, Absolutely. it can be quite an undignified condition, can't it? Pregnancy. I mean, if you ever mm. have a sort of embarrassing know. moments. Oh, yeah, I've had several embarrassing moments. One of them happened to be on somebody very posh's sofa. <laughs> when I was uh, a lot of women, uh, and uh, it was a very posh um, tea party. The mo this is the most embarrassing thing that happened. I'm sure there are others, but I can't think of them. But I was at, it was a very posh. It was in the London Docklands, and um, I, w I, went, I was invited to it. It was like a celebrity do. So you were just invited if you'd been on television. I'm sure you could. Well, you could get a lot you of never get things. invited to those things. Oh, I'm no, sure no, you no, never. <laughs> well, anyway, I didn't know anybody, and. Um, Eventually, a friend of mine came in, and we were having a laugh. And some, I won't go through the whole story because it's extremely lengthy. But to, to cut a long story short, somebody said something that made me scream with laughter. We were really enjoyed it, and which made the whole room turn round. And I suddenly realised I was feeling rather warm and rather <laughs> pleasant, actually, for, for about three seconds down below. Then I suddenly realised I was actually wet myself, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't, it is the most embarrassing and humiliating thing that's ever happened. And I didn't know. I was on a pale sofa, something similar to this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was just swayed. It could be very nice. But, um, and I didn't know what... Um, luckily, I was holding a glass of Perrier water, so I managed to put it... Oh, look what you made me do! <laughs> <laughs> I managed to make it. But unfortunately, I looked down and it was steaming, so I couldn't get away with it at all. <laughs> Let's move swiftly on to another call yeah, now. Yeah. Jan Moore from Lincoln. Hello. Good morning. What would you like to say? <laughs> you can follow that. You can say <laughs> I'd first of all like to thank Julie for one of the most utterly hilarious moments I've ever seen on television when she appeared as the little and brittle um, uh, Mrs. Overall, <laughs> particularly the episode where she was in the green and yellow leot. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, I don't know how you managed to keep a straight face. I mean, I was nearly in the state you were in then. I was absolutely <laughs> creased <laughs> out. Oh, uh, thanks very much. Absolutely wonderful. Oh, that's um, nice. You can come again. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling, Jan. Thank you. Actually, so Jan, stay by your television sets because uh, we have one little thing that we want to do. We, we all want to congratulate Jane very much indeed on her engagement. Oh, you haven't seen the ring, have you, Jane? No. Oh, I've got engaged, Jane. Oh, yes. oh, and, and here's the real time a good look. <laughs> oh, look, no, we're all evaluating wonderful. it now. She's been. Yeah. 
Okay. Absolutely dazzling everybody all morning. You know, <laughs> see the star coming yes, out. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be a married woman, yes. Oh. I'm going to be a wife. I'm rather so thrilled. I think she'd given up hope altogether, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how did they react? I just couldn't believe it. Oh, <laughs> thank you very it. much. Congratulations. Congratulations. And, um,